Um, I think Dr. Ndagura has managed to join now. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ndagura who's going to present for us today. Thank you. Okay, morning everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay. I'm going to uh, present on single intrauterine fetal demise in twins and uh, uh, it's a case series uh, presentation. Okay, so in our unit, we started uh, scanning about three years ago. I think we all know that. And so far in our system, we have about 5,932 patients. And of those, uh, 5,476 are singletons, 480 are twins, and six are triplets. For the uh, 480 total of twins, 114 are monochorionic, uh, sorry, were monochorionic twins, and 306 were dichorionic uh, twins. And for the monochorionic twins, the total is 114, like I mentioned earlier on. Uh, for those ones, we have monochorionic diamniotic twins with a total of 113. And then monochorionic monoamniotic twins, we just had one pair. So this is just a graph, just uh, illustrating the the statistics that I presented in the first slide. As you can see, we scanned uh, mostly singleton uh, pregnancies, a total of 5.470, and uh, followed by twins, about 480, and then six triplets. This is in keeping with the uh, st uh, statistics that are also uh, mentioned in literature. I think we all know that triplets are very rare and then twins are also rare and mostly we see singleton uh, pregnancies. This pie chart is also just illustrating the same information and just showing that most of the patients who uh, presented for an obstetric scan were singletons followed by uh, twins and then very few triplets. For the twins, uh, this graph and the pie chart is just illustrating that most of the twins are actually dichorionic. Like what is quoted in li literature, a ratio of about one as uh, one third as to two thirds. So you can see from this uh, graph, the monochorionic twins were about 114 versus about 300 uh, dichorionic uh, twins. So the ratio is about one is to three, and it's actually in keeping with the information that is quoted in literature. For the monochorionic twins, uh, this graph is illustrating that most of the monochorionic twins are actually monochorionic uh, diamniotic, and very few are monochorionic monoamniotic. And from literature, we all know that monochorionic monoamniotic twins are very rare. In our unit, we get uh, a few patients who are referred to us as monochorionic, monoamniotic, but when we then get to scan them, we actually note that they are actually monochorionic, diamniotic, and some of them actually dichorionic, diamniotic. So we also have to remember that monochorionic, monoamniotic twins are very rare. And in three years so far, we have seen only one set of monochorionic monoamniotic twins, and most of the monochorionic twins are actually diamniotic. So, for the twins who actually had uh, select uh, single intrauterine fetal demise, we had a total of about eight in the three years, and we had two at Parirenya Tua Hospital and six at Salimugabe Hospital. For the chorionicity of those twins, it's actually 50-50. The monochorionic 
contributed for, the dichorionic contributed for as well. So this is actually uh, telling us that monochorionic have a higher risk of a poor outcome uh, compared to dichorionic because we had 114 monochorionic twins, but for the uh, single intrauterine fetal demise, we actually see the monochorionic twins contributing 50%, though their total is actually like a third of the total number of the twins that we, we saw in the three years. So monochorionic twins are associated with uh, uh, most likely intrauterine fetal demise and a poor outcome. And we are actually seeing them contributing more, yet for the total statistics, they actually contributed only a third. So we can see from this graph, which is uh, illustrating the contribution of the monochorionic uh, versus the dichorionic twins and, and it's the contribution to single intrauterine fetal demise uh, to the total of eight. So we can actually see that the contribution is equal. So in our unit, uh, once we diagnose that a, 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 twin, a patient has single intrauterine fetal demise, we, there's a protocol that we use. Um, that protocol, uh, uh, we use it, and then uh, we scan the twins every two weeks to follow up uh, on the growth and Doppler studies of the, uh, of the survivor. If the Doppler studies become abnormal, we manage them as uh, what we do for singletons. We aim to deliver at around 37 to 38 weeks for the dichorionic and around 36 weeks for the monochorionic. However, there are some factors that we do consider before uh, uh, deciding how we are going to manage each set of uh, uh, a twin with a problem with single intrauterine fetal demise. So we, we consider the chorionicity, the gestational age at diagnosis, the etiology, and also the status of the surviving uh, twin. For the status of the surviving twin, we are looking at the growth in the Doppler studies as well. So we, we see that chorionicity and gestational age at diagnosis are the most important uh, prognostic factors uh, for the uh, uh, surviving twin. So that's why we consider what is the chorionicity of this pregnancy? What is the gestational age? And then we go on to manage them like what I outlined uh, below. So for the uh, single intrauterine fetal uh, demise in the past three years, I already mentioned that we had a total of eight. So this, in this slide, I just summarized the information for the eight patients. And I'm going to talk about five of them in this slide and the other three in the next slide. Case one uh, was a 35-year-old para-2 gravida 3. We saw her at 32 weeks with a single intrauterine fetal demise of twin one. And then she was delivered at 32 weeks uh, plus four uh, days, like four days later by emergency cesarean section. Uh, the uh, diagnosis for this uh, woman was twin to twin transfusion syndrome, and she had a monochorionic diamniotic uh, pregnancy. On delivery, twin one APCA score was actually good, eight to nine. Um, and then, uh, sorry, this was twin two with a good up, up, APCA score of eight to nine a birth weight of 2.4, and uh, she was not admitted to NICU and the baby is actually alive. However, twin one was a macerated still birth with a weight of 1.5 kgs. We can actually see the discrepancy between the twins with twin one weighing 1 1.5 and twin two weighing 2.4. And uh, this is actually showing that she probably had twin to twin transfusion syndrome. 
she had an emergency cesarean section because uh, the survivor developed uh, abnormal Doppler studies in a few days after diagnosis. Uh, case two is 35 year old para three gravida two a patient who was diagnosed again at around 32 weeks. This uh, patient we managed to push her up to about 36 weeks and she had an elective cesarean section. She delivered um, uh, a, a, a live um, fetus who was twin, one, twin two in this case with a good APGA score of nine to nine and a birth weight of 1,300. The baby was admitted to the nursery and uh, is alive until now. However, the other twin, twin one was a macerated still uh, uh, born with a weight of 1.2 kgs. Case three is 38 year old para two plus one gravita four. This one we diagnosed her at 26 plus four. She presented with a, a single intrauterine fetal demise. However, in a few days, uh, the other twin uh, developed abnormal Doppler studies and then she, she had uh, spontaneous um, preterm uh, labor and had a vaginal delivery. She delivered uh, two boys and both were not alive with twin one being a macerated stillborn and twin two a fresh stillborn and was noted to have cystic hygroma. Case four is a 39 year old para four gravida five. She presented at 26 weeks. Um, this one actually she presented with one with single intrauterine fetal demise and the other one was already um, uh, very sick with abnormal Doppler studies and anhydramnios. She had severe preeclampsia and then um, the next day we scanned the, the, the survive the other twin who had already demised. I don't know why she ended up, ended up having an emergency cesarean section. And then she delivered two boys and twin one was a macerated still uh, born and twin two was, uh, was fresh still born. Case five, we diagnosed her at 32 weeks and we managed to follow her up and then we advised cesarean section, elective cesarean section at 37 weeks. She had, um, um, we advised cesarean section at 36 weeks and then she ended up uh, uh, getting the delivery at 37 weeks. She had a monochorionic diamniotic and um, for this one, the cause of the single intrauterine fetal demise was actually unclear. She delivered a boy and a girl the boy was alive, 3.7. And um, sorry, the, the boy actually came out as a fresh still uh, born. And the cause for this one is, is not clear, but the baby was alive from 32 weeks up to about 36 weeks. And of course, twin two, um, oh, sorry, I'm mixing them up. Um, so this one, she delivered uh, a boy, twin one, who was 3.7 and was, was uh, still born. And twin two is actually alive with, it, with an abga of nine to 10 and a weight of 3.5. And then for case six to eight, uh, these pregnancies are actually ongoing. And some of these patients, they actually presented with uh, two with the uh, twins, uh, it, at a point when they were uh, still alive, the both of them, and along the course, we lost uh, uh, one of the twins, and we are actually still following them up in our unit. So case six is uh, Mrs. Uh, PZ, a para one, gravida two, 23 year old with dichorionic, diamniotic uh, twins. She presented at 18 weeks, 
And this one, uh, Twin Two was already dead at presentation. And um, we thought uh, the, the causative uh, factor in this uh, pregnancy was selective fetal growth restriction, which actually occurred very early because at 18 weeks, this is the scan that we performed on her. We can actually see that twin one is occupying most of the space with good uh, lycra volume, while uh, this twin two is sort of stuck on the on the fundus and has actually anhydramnios and is actually very small. We can see that the uh, abdominal circumference is measuring less than one percent for the gestational age. Twin one uh, had normal growth in Doppler studies, and we actually scanned her twice after the diagnosis in the, the, the survivor remains stable. We plan to continue monitoring the pregnancy every two weeks with uh, growth and uh, Doppler studies, and then to deliver her a term unless otherwise uh, it's indicated by other obstetric emergencies or if the twin becomes, the survivor becomes unwell. Case seven is a 31-year-old para two gravida three. We saw her at 33 weeks plus two days with a dichorionic diamniotic uh, pregnancy. Um, at presentation, twin two was already dead. However, the cause was actually twin one, sorry, was already dead. The cause was actually unclear, but we thought it occurred uh, at a very early gestational age. Yes, the twin is very small and is almost vanishing. The survivor, twin two, is showing signs of, um, sorry, uh, twin one is showing signs of. Uh, fetal growth restriction with an estimated fetal weight of less than 3%. However, the Doppler studies have remained normal. And uh, we actually noted that the maternal uterine artery Doppler studies are normal. She doesn't have any hypertensive disorders, uh, disorder of some sort and any other comorbidity associated with this pregnancy. So we are not quite sure what offended the, 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 the twin two. And also it seems whatever happened to twin two is now affecting twin one because twin one is showing um, uh, features of fetal growth restriction though uh, is still stable at the moment. So we plan to push the pregnancy by a few more weeks and we plan to deliver around that four to, to 36 weeks if the baby remains normal, if the baby remains stable, sorry. Case eight uh, is Mrs. A.M., a 36-year-old para, um, para four gravida five, sorry for the typo there. This one we saw her at 27 weeks. She has a dichorionic diamniotic and twin one, um, both twins were alive on presentation and twin one showed uh, uh, features of severe fetal growth restriction with an estimated fetal weight of less than 1% and um, abnormal Dopplers. And then uh, the fetus demised within about 24 hours uh, of presentation. We then, uh, uh, reviewed the, the, the survivor after about a week and the, the, the survivor remained stable with uh, uh, maintaining the growth and also Doppler studies. We plan to follow her up every two weeks and then deliver a term if delivery is not otherwise indicated. So this is the, these are the pictures uh, for the last uh, uh, Case, case eight, we can actually see that this twin is sort of trapped with no fluid. And at this point, the baby was actually alive. If we compare the, the sizes of the heads, 
for twin one, this is uh, the survivor and uh, twin two who demise. We can actually see that uh, the head for twin two is very small and is measuring less than 1%. While the head for twin one who's growing well is actually uh, looking normal. At this point, the twin uh, two was still alive. We can actually see here when we are comparing the abdominal circum uh, circumference measurements, this is for twin two, who is uh, very small and with no fluid around the, the, the baby. And the abdominal circumference is measuring um, less than 1%. Whereas for twin uh, one, we can see that it's actually big. And just by eyeballing and comparing without measuring, we can actually see that this one is bigger than the other one, yet these babies are in the same uterus in, at the same time. So we can actually see that this one is not doing well. And um, if you also look at the femur lengths, this is for twin one and this is for twin two. We can actually see that twin two is very small. So we, 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 we noted that twin two was small with abnormal Dopplers and the baby went on to die in a few days. So at least for this patient, we had an opportunity to see uh, both twins when they were still alive and we were able to examine and see what was going to cause uh, fetal demise in twin two. Unlike for most of the patients who present, who book late and then they present with already one of the twins uh, with the, the fetal demise. So for this one, we'll continue monitoring as long as twin one remains stable. So from the um, a few cases that we have, we can actually see that in our setting for the twins with single intrauterine fetal demise, selective fetal growth restriction is the leading cause, especially for dichorionic diamniotic uh, twins. And then twin to twin transfusion syndrome is also the second leading cause, especially um, in, in this applies to monochorionic diamniotic twins. We also have a uh, severe preeclampsia. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually correct to dissociate this from selective fetal growth restriction, but the picture that we saw in, a, in the patient who presented with severe preeclampsia was sort of different because the fetal growth restriction was affecting both twins severely and all of them had, were very small with uh, abnormal Doppler studies and it went on to affect both of them in a matter of hours. So I'm not sure whether separating it from the fetal growth restriction affecting one twin um, is actually correct or not. And then there are some, uh, 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 some of the patients whom we labeled uh, is the etiology is unclear because they presented late and we actually noted that um, the, the, the twin with intrauterine fetal demise actually demised at a very early, 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 early stage where we could not make up what actually caused the, 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 the death at the point when the patient uh, then presented. So we, I just labeled them as unclear, but probably if we had seen them earlier, we would have actually noted uh, the cause of the intrauterine fetal demise. We had one patient who, who upon delivery, both twins were okay. She had an elective cesarean section, but on delivery, one of the twins had a fresh still, um, one of the twins was fresh still born. I didn't uh, put her, uh, I didn't add her to my statistics, but uh, for that one, it's actually also showing that delaying a delivery of twins unnecessarily may actually result in one of the twins demising, if, especially if we keep on pushing the pregnancies beyond 38 weeks, because she was just noted to, to have a fresh stillborn uh, in one of the twins, yet the other one was 
actually okay and the cause was actually not clear. In, um, in one of the twins, we noted that there was discordance for fetal anomalies, the one who had uh, cystic hygroma, the other one was okay. And the one who died early had cystic hygroma and then the other one uh, died later on. So discordance for fetal anomalies can actually affect one of the twins and lead to fetal demise, while the other one does not have any congenital abnormalities and may actually survive to term. Hot accidents are actually are mentioned in literature as a common cause of um, uh, intra single intrauterine fetal demise. In one of the patients that I presented, we noted a cord that was sort of uh, tightly um, that was tightly applied to the neck. It's actually for the uh, last case, case eight. The cord was very tight on the twin who who, who had intrauterine fetal demise. However, that twin was very small and. He thought that they also had selective fetal growth restriction. So we are not sure whether the cord accident is what caused the, 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 the death or it's actually the selective fetal growth restriction. In the survivors, what were the complications uh, that we, we came across and what are the, what are the outcomes uh, of the ones who then made it? Uh, after delivery to Niku and then home. In the uh, eight, eight, five pregnancies that we then managed to up to delivery, three of the survivors developed fetal growth restriction. And then the three of them had abnormal Doppler studies and ended up having emergency cesarean section. And then two, they had intrauterine fetal demise. And for these ones, they died like a few days uh, after diagnosis. And we suspect that whatever that affected the other twin also went on to affect the survivor or the complications that then took place after the, the death of the other twin then um, um, led to, de to the death of the uh, survivor. And of the five pregnancies that we, 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 we managed up to term or up to delivery, three babies are alive. We can actually see that for the five pre pregnancies, we were supposed to have 10 babies and we ended up having three, mostly because of um, the problems that do take place in twins and also because of the complications that then occurred after the diagnosis of intrauterine fetal demise. So from this information that we have, we can see that in our setting, twins are survivors of uh, a pregnancy with single intrauterine fetal demise are at an increased uh, risk of being born preterm, at an increased of uh, death and uh, NICU uh, admission. And also the morbidities are uh, associated with severe prematurity and fetal growth restriction as well. For the maternal outcomes, unfortunately, these mothers, we didn't manage to, to check their uh, clotting profiles and to, 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 to look at other things that uh, may be checked for in the developed countries. But otherwise, we noted that some of them had comorbid conditions and of those uh, who had comorbid con conditions, uh, hypertensive disorders were the most common in the five patients, at least in, the eight, in all the eight patients, about three or four of them had uh, a hypertensive disorder of some sort. And we suspect that this may actually have contributed to the death of one or both of the twins. Up to date, all the mothers are alive and no significant uh, morbidity has been noted antenatally or post delivery. However, we note that in these patients, they do experience trauma and anxiety related to continuing with their pregnancy with the stillborn fetus and also to the possible outcomes of the surviving twin. And we do take our time to cancel them 
and uh, to try and uh, uh, reassure them. Okay, so I'll move on to the discussion, just two slides uh, that I put up here. And uh, in the first slide, I'll just talk about the risks for the uh, surviving uh, core twin. Um, in literature, it is noted, it is quoted that the survivor is at an increased risk of fetal demise. And in, in our eight, in our eight patients of which the five were already delivered, we actually saw that only three of the babies are alive instead of five. And I have actually mentioned that they, in our own uh, cohort, the survivor was at an increased risk of being delivered preterm. And in literature, it's also quoted that the survivors are at an increased risk of being delivered preterm because of the complications that can arise after the demise of the other twin. They are also at a more increased risk of having cerebrovascular injury. And for this, we need to, to, to examine the fetal uh, brain of the survivor using MRI scan every three weeks. And this applies for monochorionic twins. But in our setting, we are not able to do that. So we're just using Doppler studies and they were actually able to guide us as to uh, whether we should continue the pregnancy or advise delivery. They are also at a more increased risk of getting end organ damage, which can, which can actually lead to fetal demise. I've already mentioned that the most important uh, prognostic factors are the gestational age at which the other fetus demised and at which the diagnosis is made, and also the chorionicity. We have actually seen that for monochorionic twins, the outcome is um, sort of poor as compared to that for dichorionic, uh, diamniotic. For the pregnancies that we're able to push to term or up to a point when we advise delivery, most of them were dichorionic, diamniotic, and only one monochorionic, monoamniotic um, was able to continue for a few more weeks after demise of the other twin. For the management in literature, they recommend two weekly growth scans, which we do in our unit. Um, Doppler studies, we also do amniotic fluid uh, volume and uh, MRI eye scan for the survivor in a monochorionic uh, relationship. For the timing of delivery, they advise delivery 37 to 38 weeks for dichorionic. And uh, this is when there are no other obstetric complications or other complications that have arisen in the survivor. For monochorionic, they advise delivery 34 to 36 weeks. However, they also um, uh, mention that monochorionic pregnancies are a bit more difficult to manage and these ones uh, tend to be delivered within a few days or weeks uh, of diagnosis because of uh, the complications that are peculiar to the monochorionic relationship that the, the, the survivor will be having with the uh, one with uh, intrauterine and fetal demise. I would like to acknowledge the contribution uh, from all the members of the fetal medicine unit and uh, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Dr. Tlachaya. Thank you, Dr. Ndagura for that very informative um, a presentation on the twins. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to um, questions, contributions, anything that you may want to say, you may either uh, unmute and then ask your questions or contribute, or if you want, you can write in the chat um, box. Thank you.
Okay, um, as you're waiting with your questions, I'm just going to um, ask from the, there's a, there's someone who wrote in the chat, uh, I think it's Dr. Kanonge. He says, his question is this, is the FMU confirming amyonicity and chorionicity a delivery for the patients that present late? In other words, how accurate is sonography in diagnosing chorionicity and amniocity? That's Dr. Kanonge's question. Okay, so for thank you very much, Dr. Kanonge, for it, it's actually a good question. In our unit, we actually confirm, we go through the delivery records to check if the midwife or the doctor who uh, delivered the patient actually confirmed the chorionicity that will have suggested on ultrasound scan. And most of the times it's actually in keeping and we think for our unit so far we are doing well in terms of um, uh, actually diagnosing the chorionicity on ultrasound scan. So I, I, I would say, of course our patients they present late in the third trimester Whereas uh, for the patients who present early in the first trimester, uh, confirmation of chronicity is very easy and anyone at the midwife or sonographer can actually, even the junior doctor or medical student can actually do it. But as the pregnancy progresses, it actually becomes more and more difficult, but we are trying our best and actually most of the patients that we do uh, label as dichorionic or monochorionic on upon delivery, they actually are confirmed as such. However, we have a, a problem with a few um, uh, midwives or doctors who don't write anything concerning the chorionicity after delivering a twin pregnancy. So we actually find that a little mm -hmm. bit worrying to say a person can deliver twins and not mention that this was a dichorionic or monochorionic pregnancy. So encourage the doctors and the midwives to provide that information in the patient's booklet. Thank you, Dr. Kachan. Okay, uh, Dr. Kachan, I hope you've been answered, uh, but maybe it's um, the onus upon us uh, in the FM fetal medicine unit to actually um, alert the other doctors on the ground that when they do deliveries, uh, they should mention um, that the, there were two placentas or there was one placenta. And in that way, then we can also add that onto our data. Thank you, Dr. Kanongi, and thank you, Dr. Ndagurwa. Um, Dr. Madembo, you have your hand up. You can go ahead with your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndagurwa, for a beautiful presentation. Uh, my question is related to the previous question. Uh, uh, probably, it would be also be good to add in your analysis uh, the median uh, gestation at which uh, the chorionicity um, was diagnosed. Uh, and also, uh, like what you are saying, that uh, the, there was congruence in your findings, the sonographic findings, and what was uh, detected in delivery in terms of the chorionicity, amniocity. So probably it would be also be good to just add another slide on the um, average age at which the chorionicity uh, was, uh, was diagnosed. Uh, we know that, like what you said, we know that it's much easier and much better in the first trimester. But for also our court, it would be also be good just to know the average age at which uh, the chorionicity was uh, diagnosed. And that's okay, Doc. Thank you very much.